When I was a child, my favorite thing to do was to watch my mother. I sit on the fluffy pink toilet seat in her bathroom and watch her as she turned the Dixie peach powder into actually her brown color. As she put lipstick on and blotted her lips to keep it from smearing. As she took those pink curls out of her hair and fluffed her curls perfectly so, and then blasted them with some kind of hairspray to keep them in place. I loved watching her. I watched her at the kitchen table as she floured biscuits, made them from scratch. I loved watching her take the little bits and the drippings from the beef shoulder roast and turning it into gravy for the, my favorite mashed potatoes. I love that she fried chicken and drained the chicken so that it would stay crisp. I watched mom watch the world and I got cues from her about how to make meaning of it. I watched her make soup and take it to sick neighbors. I watched her stretch our dinner time and time again for the little boy named Ricardo who lived down the street, who was a latchkey kid and never had enough to eat. I watched her go visit church members in the hospital. Daily, I was learning from her every day, how to laugh, how to cry, when to mourn, when to dance. What it meant to be a good person. That time that girl Lisa called me the N-word in kindergarten, mom put that story in context. She told me it was silly that someone wouldn't like me because I was black planting anti-racist seeds in a five-year-old, teaching me that I could be an activist, that I could pray for the world to have peace and that that would help me to fight racism. This is a woman who prayed every day, every day on her knees before she left her bedroom. And every night she prayed with me and my siblings. But first she watched the evening news, CBS only, that was her jam. Walter Cronkite and Roger Mudd came into our living room, first in black and white and then in color, interpreting world events, which mommy then interpreted for us, for me. That little boy, he's saluting his daddy, the president. Those people, they're marching for voting rights. The police are beating them because they don't want black people to vote. They don't want them to have the power it will give them. People with power don't like to give it up. Those people in Washington, they're listening to Dr. King dream his dream of how no matter our color, we will all have power one day, one day, one day we'll all be free. He's dreaming God's dream. Mom helped me learn about God's dream while praying on my knees, while saying grace at the dinner table and in church. She was the mediator, the interpreter, the translator of what God was saying, of God, God's desire, God's will, God's way. Do unto others as, as you'd have them do unto you. Pray for your enemies. Do not curse them. Honor your parents. A liar shall not tarry in God's sight. This bread, this bread means God will always love you. This cup means God will never leave you. I fell in love with God because mom loved God. Before I was sure I was called to ministry, I was sure because mommy said so, that God was calling me to be a good person. And then my job was to listen to that calling. And when I heard it, I was to say yes. Samuel's mother, Hannah, no doubt gave her precious, much prayed for boy love lessons before she gave him up to serve God. I see him watching her, as every child does, to get lessons on how to live life. So when Eli, the priest at Shiloh, effectively became Samuel's foster father, Hannah would make an annual trip with her husband, Elkanah, to worship God and to bring her son a little robe to wear, one like Eli's son's robes, so he'd be properly dressed for his vocation. 
properly dressed while being tutored. In our text today, we get to overhear some of the tutoring. Listen to a word from God in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. I'm reading the message version. The boy Samuel was serving God under Eli's direction. This was at a time when the revelation of God was rarely heard or seen. One night, Eli was sound asleep. His eyesight was very bad. He could hardly see. It was well before dawn. The sanctuary lamp was still burning. And Samuel was still in the bed in the temple of God where the chest or the ark of God rested. Then God called out, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, yes, I'm here. And then he ran to Eli saying, I heard you call. Here I am. Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And so he did. And God called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli. I, I heard you call. Here I am. Again, Eli said, son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. This all happened before Samuel knew God for himself. It was before the revelation of God had been given to him personally. God called again, Samuel, the third time. Yet again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Yes, I heard you call me. Here I am. That's when it dawned on Eli that God was calling the boy. So Eli directed Samuel, go back and lie down. If the voice calls again, say, speak God. I'm your servant, ready to listen. Samuel returned to his bed. Then God came and stood before him, exactly as before, calling out, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, speak. I'm your servant, ready to listen. Now Samuel slept right next to that chest or the ark of God, the presence of God, but he was still learning. He didn't recognize the voice of God for what it was. He didn't recognize the teaching of God, the calling of God for what it held for him. So he needed help. Eli, his foster father, the priest, his mentor, mediated the word of God for the boy. That's God speaking right there. When you hear that, listen. And when he listened, God heard, God said, sorry, to Samuel, Eli's two sons are going to be punished. Eli's two sons are going to be punished. They were, we've been told in chapter two, scoundrels and wicked men. They'd shown disregard for God and for the work that they were called to do. I don't know what was up with them, but they instructed their servants to steal the sacrificial meat, the meat entrusted to the priest in the temple. They instructed their servants to steal that meat from the pots that were used in worship, to take the best cuts, like the filet mignon and the ribeye, even the parts that were reserved for God. And if this meat was not freely given, the servants were instructed to take the meat by force, with violence. Not only that, these boys, these scoundrels, they slept with the women desperate enough to hang about the temple, hoping to make a little cash so they could survive. These priests in training, Eli's boys, used their power, abused their power, forced the people in their employ to be dishonest, to steal, to be violent. And they took advantage of the poor and the vulnerable. They persisted in this behavior, even when confronted by their dad. Eli called them wicked and their deeds evil. Still, these young men could not stop themselves. They did not stop themselves. These were the kind of abuses that could feel small, but in fact, they were not only sins against the people, they were sins against God. They acted, these religious leaders, these called out, set apart people acted as though their selfish, 
elitist greed and lust was consistent with the word of God, with the vision of God that Eli had been unable to confer fully to them. They told themselves that their behavior was justified, that they were entitled to it in the name of God, able to do it, to violate God's people, to steal from God's people, to abuse God's people because they were chosen and set apart. As their father, Eli, the priest, had been unable to stop them, they offended God. They blasphemed God. Listen, they blasphemed God because they took advantage of God's people and misused their leadership, their office, misused their role, bastardizing the word of God, reading their greed, their avarice, their entitlement, their lust onto God, <laughs> putting that stuff into God's mouth as theirs. And honestly, friends, the, punish, the punishment for this feels harsh to me. The punishment was death. Death. That's what, that's what God told Samuel. I'm going to have to kill Eli's boys. Let them die. And I'm not comfortable. I am not comfortable thinking about God that way. Fact. But when Eli heard this, when the priest heard this, that God was planning to, to let his boys die because of what they had done, Eli said, God is God. Let God do whatever God thinks is best. Let God be God. And let God do what God thinks is best. Now, I don't know the mind of God to know what God thinks is best for God, but God has made it clear through the prophets and the priests and the teachers over time, through the great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us, God has made it clear through the words of the preachers and the teachers what God thinks is best for us. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor and love the stranger. Love the strangest neighbor of all as you love yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do not bear false witness. Do not lie. Do not covet. Do not kill. Pray for your enemies. Do not persecute them. Love me with everything you have. Loving me means loving your people, loving your posse. Loving me means letting justice roll down like waters and righteousness like mighty streams. Loving me means doing justice, loving mercy, walking humbly with me where I take you. This is the calling of God on our lives. It was the calling of God on the lives of those scoundrel boys. It's the calling of Eli, the calling of Samuel. It's, the, yes, the calling of me and Amanda and Ben, Natalie, John, those of us who are called to ministry. But friends, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. Everyone who says the word God in reverence, in awe, everyone who, who says that they love God, that lean into God as protector, as waymaker, in service of God, you and I are called to be revolutionary, fierce lovers in the name of God, we are called to make heaven on earth. We are called to make a way out of no way. We are called to make the high places low and the low places high. We are called to equal it out so that the least are first and the first are last. We are called to set a banquet for the lame and the blind and the poor and the disenfranchised to come and sit at table where everyone is welcome. We are called to love all the people, no matter who they love, no matter how they look, no matter how they make a living. We are called to stand up for them, to love them, even, whew, 
and this is the hard part, even when they're not lovable, and even when they deserve our disdain. When Martin King was a boy, he had a white playmate whose father owned a store just across the street from their family home. The boys were close until they started school, which meant, of course, they went to separate segregated schools. And they began to play less and less together. But one day, one day the boy told Martin that his father, the boy's father, demanded that he never, ever play with Martin again. And Martin wrote this in his papers. He said, I will never forget what a great shock this was to me. I immediately asked my parents about the motive behind such a statement. We were at the dinner table when the situation was discussed and here for the first time, I was made aware of the existence of a race problem. I had never been conscious of it before. As my parents discussed some of the strategies that had resulted from this problem and some of the ways that they had been insulted, I was shocked. And from that moment on, I was determined, listen now, for Martin. I was determined to hate every white person. As I grew older and older, this feeling continued to grow. My parents would always tell me that I should not hate the white man, but that it was my Christian duty to love him. And this is the point where the religious element came in. The question rose in my mind, how could I love a race of people who hated me and who had been responsible for breaking me up with one of my best friends? This was a great question in my mind for numbers of years. I did not conquer this anti-white feeling until I entered college and came into contact with white students. Does that story surprise you? Mr. We Shall Overcome? Mr. I Have a Dream? Little boy hurt by a little white boy began to grow his hate white people muscle. Now I know all of us nice, black, kind, sweet people don't ever have that feeling. But I will tell you, the other day, I was talking to my daughter-in-law, Gabby, and we came to the conclusion that sometimes we can make up all kinds of psychological, sociological analyses about why people are acting crazy, why they're breaking into the Capitol, why they're hitting people in the head with fire, fire extinguishers. Or sometimes we said in our gently most loving way, white people are just being white. I told that story to my therapist who's a white lesbian and she cracked up. I said, just white, meaning just whiteness, just entitled, just living it out, just doing the thing, just being white, not trying to be nefarious, not trying to be evil, just being themselves, just being white people who grew up in a nation who taught them that it was all right to be white that way. I was surprised to find out that Martin and I had the same kind of experience. He was six, I was five. Both of our parents, all four of our parents, told us you don't get to hate white people because they're being stank. You don't get to hate, hate white people because they called you the N-word. You don't get to call Lisa a cracker because she called you the N-word. You are a child of God, called by God to be a child of God and you are called to love, period. Imagine, imagine the world if Martin's mom and daddy didn't teach him that. He'd have been charismatic, he'd have been a good preacher, he'd have said amazing words, but he wouldn't have been talking about the love revolution that he talked about and the one that we so desperately need. Friends, before a little child can lead us, they have to be taught what's loving, what's generous, what's just, what's fair, what's equitable, what's kind, what's right. Everything isn't right. Progressive, open-minded people, <laughs> right? There's a difference between a violent insurrection and marching for a love revolution. There's a difference between lies and truth. There's a difference between violence and peace. There's a difference between death 
and life. Our little people, our children, our young adults are watching us and wondering what in the hell is going on here? Like Samuel, they need to be mentored and have God's word mediated by a priesthood of all believers, of all who believe in love, to hold up a mirror and say, here is what God wants from us. Do not take the best from the poor. Do not bastardize God's word and read into it your greed and avarice and malice. Do not use women's bodies, trans bodies, people's bodies. Do not violate God's people because when you do, you break God's heart and you blaspheme God. And though I think a death sentence is absolutely out of line, deadness follows when we don't value each other's lives. We need a revolution of values. We need moral imagination. We need holy courage. We need bold, brave leaders to speak from places of compassion and humility. Yes, we need to hold our leaders accountable. Yes, we need to make this nation loving, fair, and just for the first time, but no, no, we don't get to be violent on the way to peace. I wish mommy was here to thank her for planting seeds of love where seeds of hatred could grow. To thank her for modeling brave, bold, truth-telling that doesn't have to kill the other to be heard. I wish she were here to pray with me, to hold my hand, to say, precious, precious, I've got you. But she bequeathed me to you, mi gente, and to our God. We have each other to, to hold accountable, to show the way to love, to light the way to truth, to lead the way to freedom. This is the fierce love we're called to do in the world. Everything ain't right. We are called to love, period. Love, period. May it be so.